Hello everyone, and my name is Grace Suva, and I'm one of the managers on the Implementation Science team at RNEO. So welcome to today's um, information sharing webinar. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar, and I'd also like to introduce to you Andrea Stubbs. She is the project lead of the Best Practice Champions program, and she will be online to help anyone who has any technical questions in relation to today's webinar. So our monthly webinars is a, a way to support um, RNEO's best practice champions and their work in guideline implementation. And all the speakers that we've had are those who are actively involved in BPG implementation. So today we'll be focusing on Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center's presentation on marketing best practice guidelines. Uh, but before we get started, just wanna keep some housekeeping items in mind. Uh, one, we really encourage um, individuals to participate in these webinars and we want to keep them interactive, engaging. So, um, you know, uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And I really encourage you to type in in the chat box any questions or comments that you have. And I'll share that with uh, George, who is our presenter, as well as moderate the questions that you have. Um, please, just when you send your questions or comments, to write to all attendees and uh, all panelists and attendees uh, so that everyone can see your comments and questions. And we have also uh, started to record these presentations so that they can be archived for future viewing. Um, and we will also be circulating the, the slide deck after this presentation. So I'd like to be able to introduce to you today's presenter. Um, his name is George Fieber and has been an RN since 1988 and is currently a nursing practice leader at Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center. His nursing career includes extensive experience in critical care nursing, clinical education, management, and two terms as president of the College of Nurses of Ontario. So for those of you who are not familiar with um, BPSO, um, because George uh, will be speaking about this, it stands for a Best Practice Spotlight Organization, and BPSOs are healthcare organizations as well as academic organizations um, who have been selected by RNEO through our request for proposals process to implement and evaluate um, the implementation of our best practice guidelines. So uh, what we aim to do is, you know, really have a dynamic supportive environment, uh, supportive partnership with these organizations and ultimately for all of us make a positive impact on patient care through evidence-based practice. And we do this through a, formally, a formal agreement um, over a three-year uh, three period. So given that, um, I'm going to pass it on uh, to George. And George, I'm going to give you the um, control for your slides. Okay, there you go, George. Take it away. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, talk to you this afternoon. Uh, you have the benefit of the fact that I did this presentation for a different group yesterday, so hopefully uh, I'll be a lot more polished today. Um, I'm just going to just check in to see if I can move this slide down to the next one. Bear with me for one sec. Here we go. Okay, so sorry about that, just getting used to this mouse. So um, we've been uh, working on the BPSO project since 2009. 2013, we became um, a BPSO. Uh, just to give you a little background on um, our hospital, we, we are a 375 bed acute care hospital in Northwestern Ontario. Uh, and we just got approved for 60 transitional care beds that we set up on an offsite location back in um, uh, just before Christmas. Uh, to give you some context, um, we're not very big hospital, but we serve um, a catchment area that uh, extends as far west as Kenora, Ontario on the Manitoba border and stretches east past Wawa. The population is only roughly between three and 400,000 people, but the catchment area is the size of France. Um, we're Ontario's newest teaching hospital. We are affiliated with the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. And as I mentioned, we've been a BPSO since 2013. 
Um, currently, we've implemented 13 best practice guidelines. 14 and 15 are actually in the process of being implemented. And uh, we have roughly 170 um, uh, best practice guideline champions in the organization. So the original best practice guidelines that we implemented were the assessment of vascular access. This was directly linked to when we uh, started our uh, nurse initiated uh, PEC program. Um, so it just made sense to include the vascular access best practice guidelines. Um, assessment and management of pain was also extremely important to us because we were in the process of developing a pain service, so that connected well. Um, we were also in the process of becoming a patient and family-centered care uh, hospital. So establishing the therapeutic relationship BPG made good sense. And like the rest of the province, we were in the process of integrating smoking cessation into nursing practice, and we were part of the falls uh, prevention process that the province had already kicked off. So timing is everything. So the first thing we did, we took a look at what was going on in our part of the province and things we needed to do. The reason we were uh, kick-starting a PIC program was because we had a, an abysmal, uh, abysmal, abysmally long waiting period for patients to get access to chemotherapy. Uh, until we started putting uh, PIC lines in by nurses, you had to wait for a, a surgeon, get a Hickman put in. Sometimes the wait, the wait was over two weeks and that was unacceptable. Um, we were also taking a look at patient satisfaction surveys that indicated that we weren't doing a great job on meeting patient expectations on pain management. Um, as I mentioned, we were also trying to initiate a transfer, really a, a cultural transformation in our organization that was going to be focused on patient family-centered care. And there was a really good synergy between that and um, adopting RNAO best practice guidelines, which were evidence-based and all geared to improve uh, patient care outcomes. Um, um, the community was also aware that we were committed to becoming smoke-free and uh, falls prevention, as I mentioned, was a huge uh, provincial initiative and it just, it all worked out at, um, the timing was everything. For anybody who's just starting this um, uh, BPSO, uh, process is just um, maybe in their first year. We focused on five BPGs, probably a lot more than um, we were really set up resource-wise to handle. We bit off more than we could chew. Uh, I personally, if I were had to do it all over again, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't go with more than three. Part of that too was because we were a relatively small hospital at the time. I was the only person doing not only nursing practice. But I was in charge of professional practice for the for the organization, and I had um, a very small group of clinical nurse specialists to support that. Uh, things have improved greatly. We have four nurses who are working in professional practice and nursing practice, and I've got 13 clinical nurse specialists now, and they are all very good at supporting the BPSO initiative. So we're supposed to be talking about marketing today. And um, I call it marketing because that's exactly what you're doing is you are selling best practice guidelines as a more efficient, a more um, evidence-based way of doing your nursing practice. And you have to convince people that this makes sense. Um, when we got the PIC program up and running, uh, the PIC nurses were really the face of our vascular access BPG. We spent a great deal of time um, making sure that the rest of the organization knew who they were, why we were doing PICs, how we were going to do it. Um, we spent a lot of time also um, getting some good local media coverage about um, why we were doing the nurse-led uh, PIC program and tying it into um, a, uh, a media campaign focusing on our commitment to good patient outcomes. Um, just as a sidebar there, we have a deal with the local newspaper here in Thunder Bay that every Wednesday 
we get one full page at the back of the first section that is dedicated to uh, healthcare, healthcare services, and information that we bring forward. So things like any new programs that we're introducing, uh, we use it as an opportunity to talk about best practice guidelines, to celebrate um, advances in nursing practice and other areas of the hospital. And uh, we'll be using that site also to advertise the work we're gonna be doing during Nurses Week this year. So that's one good way to market um, what you're doing and to get support from the community so that they actually know what we're talking about when we talk about best practice guidelines. Uh, we had also initiated um, uh, a campaign to identify pain as the fifth vital sign. And I know that dates us a little bit because I know the language and focuses have changed, but at the time it was really important because as I mentioned, we were reacting to comments that had come back in the um, uh, customer satisfaction surveys that the hospital was doing. Um, we are now recognized as a patient and family-centered care um, center of excellence. Uh, we have had some um, research done here about PFCC and we've published a few things and have been recognized as a leader in Canada. Uh, when it comes to smoking cessation, at the time, because of funding commitments that we got from uh, Cancer Care Ontario, we were able to create a quit coach position. Uh, this was, uh, the quit coach was available to uh, hospital patients, but also hospital staff, and uh, was able to refer them to services they might need, to um, uh, medications that they may require to uh, help them with their uh, attempts to quit smoking. And uh, the quit coach, we had posters, we had advertising locally, so people knew what was going on here. Um, as far as falls prevention goes, um, we were identifying high-risk patients by using the, um, the Morse assessment tool, tool, but also using an orange wristband that identified patients who were at high risk of falling. In order to kick off that campaign, we did a Falls Goes Orange um, Blitz. Uh, the center point was uh, one of our volunteers had a big Newf Newfoundland service dog. We uh, hooked him up to a cart, put orange sides on the side, uh, filled the cart with uh, orange juice, and we would travel from nursing unit to nursing unit and into waiting areas, uh, passing out orange juice to highlight our uh, Falls Goes Orange campaign. I know it sounds corny, but sure works. You get TV coverage, you get radio coverage, and you get uh, your picture in the local paper when you do stuff like this. And people remember, and they understand, and they make the connection between what you're trying to accomplish with the, um, uh, with the marketing uh, gimmicks, I guess, for lack of a better word, that you use to get the message across. Great dog, by the way. I've got one, my, one of my own. Okay, so um, continuing with this idea about marketing your changes and uh, using it as a way to get the message across, part of that is directly related to, at least it's been my experience, that when you introduce a practice change of any sort, part of your education has to be being able to show the staff, um, the clinicians, what's in it for them. Uh, it's, it's not enough simply to say that this will uh, improve patient outcomes. You have to show that there may actually be an advantage for them. So one of the things we did when we introduced preventing pressure injuries, uh, we had a couple of things that were going on. We did our, all our education blitzes related to reducing pressure injuries, pressure ulcers. We did them on Wednesdays. So we had the Wound Wednesday Lunch and Learns. These were, sometimes they were catered. Um, sometimes because of limited budgets, it was just uh, booking a lecture theater, inviting people to bring their own brown bag lunch. And we would have different presentations going on. Whether it was one of our wound nurses or a plastics physician, or somebody from occupational therapy, or whatever the specialist was. So we did these Wound Wednesday campaigns. We always did them as one half hour packages, so people knew how long 
the presentation would be, and that way we could also hit the staggered lunch times that were on clinical units. Um, we also connected to what we created was called the skin campaign. And I'm more than happy to share any of this stuff, by the way, uh, when, the slides, when the slide package goes out, if you'd like to see some of this marketing material, I'm more than happy to share it. But this was a very specific campaign with posters that we used to highlight how important it was to do a proper skin assessment and then what interventions could the nurse at the bedside do over and above contacting the wound specialist to deal with um, patients who are at high risk for skin breakdown. Um, when we did the, um, uh, the triple D BPBG, if you're not familiar, that's the uh, dementia, depression, delirium, best practice guideline. Once again, we spent a lot of time uh, doing some external education using that uh, um, uh, newspaper access that we have to explain to the public that, you know, what a high percentage of the patients that we had admitted here were uh, of a geriatric age and that we were committed as an organization to make sure that we had better outcomes uh, for our older senior patient population. Um, this was also highlighted on um, where we tried to connect the education that we were doing in the hospital for staff to education that we could also share with the public. And we have a very large group of committed patient and family advisors. These are uh, volunteers, either former patients or families of patients who were consulted and continue to be consulted on all the best practice guidelines that we introduce and especially when it came to dealing with the particular challenge of caring for the, uh, the senior age patient who might have uh, acute care issues, but also be dealing with um, the chronic conditions such as Alzheimer's and things like this. So a lot of time spent on getting that message internally and also going external to the uh, community that we serve. Uh, another one of the, um, uh, BPGs that we've introduced uh, focuses on continence, which is comes from or is focused more on long-term care patients and comes from the long-term long -term care BPGs. But since we are now supporting um, these 60 uh, transitional beds, these are mostly patients who are waiting for transfer to long-term care or in the process of getting ready to go home. Um, we thought it was timely to introduce a best practice guideline that really focused on, the, on those particular issues. And part of the continence best practice guideline, um, we introduced the Lose the Tube campaign, um, which uh, originated out of uh, some of the teaching hospitals in Toronto and is supported by uh, the Ontario and Canadian Associations of Internal Medicine Specialists and um, basically focuses on uh, initiatives that reduce the amount of Foley catheters are being used with the idea that will help us reduce the number of um, hospital acquired UTIs. So we've got that up and running now. We started at the transitional care unit and now it's part of the uh, practice regime here on the inpatient units as well. Um, that was advertised with explanations, uh, poster campaigns in the building but also taking the opportunity to educate the public by using that um, uh, newspaper connection that we have. Um, we also have an internal, internal nursing newsletter that uh, goes out every quarter. Uh, if anybody does has experience putting that together, it's a huge amount of work, but it's another great way of avoiding the silo mentality the fact that best practice guidelines are only a nursing uh, initiative, it gets the word out across the organization so that everybody knows what we're doing as far as improving patient care. Um, we also have a clinical tip of the week that goes out every Monday morning via email to all nursing staff, but can be shared through other clinical areas because we send it out to managers. And what uh, most of those clinical tips have got some sort of connection to one of the best practice guidelines that we have implemented here 
And once again, I mentioned external media. Uh, local media has actually clicked on to some of these uh, tips of the week and use that, and they've been used for content uh, for external media. So um, it's not enough just to be doing this stuff inside the organization. If you're going to get support, and I, I'm talking about financial human resources support that you would normally get from your senior management team, if you've also got the support of your patient family advisors, that big volunteer group, that's a great group of cheerleaders who help support these initiatives and make them happen. Okay. So, sorry, I skipped a slide there. So when we talk about sus sustainability, you've done your marketing, you've initiated your uh, practice change, you've got your best practice guideline up, up and running. How do you keep these things going? How do you sustain the change in practice? And that's the three pillars that we're talking about here. Education, surveillance, and support are crucial. And I'll kind of break it down quickly on each one of those. So this is a slide I see all the time in presentations. Education is the key to success. Is it true? Yes, to a point, but it's got to go beyond education. And by that, I mean you spend a great deal of time educating staff, putting all these resources into it. You have to make sure that not only are they getting the initial message, but you want these changes to be sustained and you don't want people falling back on old practice. So what we've committed to, uh, what we have committed to as a practice department is we do education sessions supporting changes in practice, not just the current best practice guideline that we're focusing on, but we go back and we do practice reviews on BPGs that we launched at the very beginning. I call this the six month bump and I didn't invent that. It's a, uh, a methodology other hospitals are using. And basically what that means is once you've done your kickoff, once you've got your best practice guideline up and running and you've initiated those practice changes, if you want to sustain it, about every six months or so, you have to go back and do a little more education get the word out, remind people, um, make sure they haven't fallen back on old practice. And that's why my clinical nurse specialists do such a great job because they are masters at finding educational opportunities, education in the moment. Uh, sometimes we refer to it as soundbite education, that 10 minute safety or practice huddle that they will convene on a nursing unit uh, going over important points about a particular best practice guideline or answering any questions staff may have. And of course, we've also integrated this into nursing orientation so that people understand why we're doing these things. And once again, the nursing newsletter, the practice tip of the week, that real-time education, that's all part of our commitment to supporting practice improvement here at the organization. You have to take advantage of every opportunity also to recruit more practice champions. So while you're doing your education, if you, get, you find somebody that's really interested or eager or has a passion about a particular area in practice, those are the people that you want to try to recruit as champions and give them the opportunity to attend a practice workshop. Um, our our uh, partners at St. Joseph's Care Group here in Thunder Bay have applied to um, host a um, champions workshop in, in this fall. We will work together with them to make sure there's a good turnout. And that's been a very successful um, tool for us. We've done it over the last couple of years, uh, working together with other practice champion partners in Thunder Bay, which include the Thunder Bay Health Unit and uh, our friends at Pioneer Ridge Long-Term Care. So we try to support educational opportunities that come up and uh, it's been very successful for us. Okay, so surveillance. By surveillance, I mean, you might think that people are using the practice changes. All that work you've done on improving policies and doing education, you hope that they got the message, but you have to make sure that they did get the message. And I'll give you a few examples of what we do as far as surveillance. So. When we introduced the pressure injury prevention uh, best practice guideline, one of the things we do to make sure that patients are being assessed 
and the right interventions are being implemented. We do chart audits every month. It's a major pain in the butt because I have to do them manually, but I pull between 10 and 20 charts on each inpatient unit and do a, a quick review to make sure that patients are being assessed and that um, when referrals have to be sent on high-risk patients that they're actually getting sent and um, staff are aware that they can access things like an air mattress or wound consultation or a consultation with plastics, whatever it takes to make sure that the patient gets um, good interventions before we have a huge problem. We don't want the stage two ulcer turning into a stage four. Um, we also do a pressure, uh, pressure injury prevalence and incident study. We do it twice a year. Um, when we first introduced the program and we did our first p &I, I was horrified to see that we were running at 27% of our total patient, patient population had a stage two or worse pressure injury. Uh, now that we've been working on this for the last three years, we've been able to reduce that prevalence down to 9%. Our incident number is actually down under 2%. Um, so our prevalence kind of reflects the fact that because we are the catchment area for this part of the province, we do get patients with very severe pressure injuries that they developed before they got here being transferred into the hospital to be seen by plastics or uh, whatever the intervention has to be. So even in that circumstance, the fact that we've got prevalence at 9% and our incidence under two is I think directly related to the work we did on introducing the best practice guideline and making sure that the assessments and interventions are happening. Uh, we also do spot audits um, for, to support the falls um, BPG. Um, we will just do random audits across the organization to make sure that high-risk patients are being identified properly. We pull charts, do the audits to make sure the worst assessments are being done. We're, we're still in a situation we have to do this manually because we don't have the IT IS support in place to run these reports electronically, but we're working on that. It's just a, a resource issue right now. But in order to have the manpower to do these things, I've uh, relied heavily on the late career initiative, which looks like it may have died because there doesn't seem to be any word this year, but we've been very successful in the past of getting funding for the late career. I use nursing students. Uh, I have um, a, a strong connection with our um, uh, WSIB uh, nurse here in occupational health and safety. If she has somebody who's on modified duties and who can work safely in my department, then I have them doing things like, like chart audits. Um, it's, I think it's crucial to make sure that all the work you did to introduce the BPG is being sustained. And right now we rely uh, on um, having the bodies in the department. Uh, we also submit to Enquire just our falls data right now, but we hope to expand that as well. So your support for these programs, that's the third tier of sustainability. And it starts with the fact that we look at our nursing practice um, office, the clinical nurse specialists who um, uh, are so important to what we do and the fact that we believe that our connection to RNAO and the best practice guideline program, we, we are agents of change in our organization and we take that very, very seriously. We've also um, augmented what we're doing under best practice guidelines. We joined uh, niche or niche, depending on how you pronounce it, but we joined that organization last year. Um, and we have to date graduated approximately 50 nurses from the niche geriatric resource nurse certificate program, which builds on all the work that we're doing to introduce best practices that support better outcomes for our senior patients. Um, I mentioned to you that our uh, patient and family advisors are great cheerleaders for us when we uh, need necessary resources to do our jobs properly. I've got a meeting this afternoon where I'm going after a quarter million dollars to buy better mattresses to replace some of our, 
our mattress stock because you can't prevent pressure injuries if you've got your patients lying on old beat up mattresses. Um, I mentioned the practice change initiatives, the six month bump. That is a regular um, part of our routine and we schedule those six month bump education events. Um, late career initiative I mentioned already. Uh, student placements, um, I was very deliberate in approaching our, um, our uh, colleagues at Lakehead University School of Nursing and Confederation College to get students placed in our department. It's not your typical clinical placement, but for a, for a smart fourth year student who does a placement in practice office means you've got hands available to help with the audits, to help with education, but you've also got an opportunity to convert somebody into a best practice guideline. Um, uh, expert might be going too far, but they'll understand the concepts. So when they do take a job at our organization, they already have a pretty good understanding of what best practice guidelines are and how important they are. Um, probably one of our biggest challenges, but when it works, is getting physicians to co-lead um, a working group or a committee that focuses on practice change. It's, that has been very, very difficult. But when it does work, and in, I gave you an example on this slide of our Lose the Tube initiative, which is part of that continence best practice guideline, um, the, uh, our chief of staff uh, is doing a lot of work to make sure that um, his colleagues and the rest of the organization understand how important that sort of thing is. So my last slide here is basically just a, a recap of the work we have done since 2009. Very challenging, um, but definitely well worth it. And um, uh, I think you can see that everything that we have done makes sense in the context of an acute care hospital that's serving such a, a, a large, um, a geographically diverse, uh, uh, a different kind of population than you might find, for instance, in southern Ontario. And um, there are some unique things about living in uh, northwestern Ontario that are reflected in the health of our patients. And um, we are very conscious of the fact that our nursing practice needs to reflect the needs and requirements of that, of that patient group. It's a hell of a lot of work, but in the long run, it's, it's good for everybody. And I've only got one slide left, but, and that's not coming up, but that's okay. It was just um, the one that, that says questions. So that's the, that's the presentation. Um, and as I was saying, I'm more than happy to share any of the marketing material, any of the information that we talked about today. And, uh, I'll leave it up to Grace to uh, coordinate some questions. Excellent. Great. Thank you, George. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful presentation. And um, I really, um, I really like the, your practical approach to uh, sustainability and the fact that you're able to break it down into those key areas um, that support success when it comes to, you know, sustaining those BPG um, in best practices over the long term. So now we're gonna go into the uh, Q&A session and we have about 10 minutes for that. Uh, George, I do have a few questions in the chat box that I'm gonna read out to you. Sure. Okay, so um, L. Taggart says, um, you may have mentioned this, but with regards to the newspaper, does your facility have a regular column? And if not, how do you generate interest? Um, it, it's not a column per se. The local newspaper has reserved that one that one page for us um, f for every Wednesday edition. So our communications department uh, puts a lot of time and effort into uh, planning content, uh, building up a bank of information that should go in there. I'm only one of several contri uh, contributors. Uh, our hospital foundation also uses that space. Uh, it's part of our fundraising campaign. It's uh, when we have uh, special events like Nurses Week coming up, for instance. 
uh, we've already written a couple of articles in conjunction with our uh, colleagues in communication, and those will be submitted to the newspaper about a week before Nurses Week, so the word gets out there. So um, uh, it's not so much a column, it's kind of uh, uh, articles of interest, and the feedback we get is pretty positive. Even some of our staff who don't uh, check their email on a regular basis or are kind of um, uh, uh, not really engaged in what's going on in the organization get a lot of information just when they pick up the newspaper. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting but old-fashioned type of advertising, but uh, in this neck of the woods, people still read a newspaper and it gets a message across. Okay, great. I mean, you definitely uh, tapped into, um, you know, what works for the community and you tailored your marketing strategies to that. So it sounds really good. Um, there is a question, and this is a, this is a clinical question, uh, George. After the initial Braden score, how often are you doing it at, during admission? We do it daily. And uh, we also do Braden Q scale on uh, our pediatric patients. So every patient is supposed to be assessed within 24 hours of admission, and then they're assessed on a daily basis uh, until time of discharge. Okay, excellent, thank you. Right, let me see here, there is, there's actually one question, a uh, couple questions that have come in to me specifically. Uh, the one is, what role does clinical leadership play in sustaining practice change? <laughs> um, you have to have a voice at the senior management table and that's usually the chief nursing executive. Um, um, for many years in our organization, that was uh, Dr. Rhonda Crocker Ellicott, who was a board member at RNAO as well. And um, Rhonda has gone uh, and um, has moved on, but we're, our new CNE starts on April the 1st, and I'm sure that she will do the same thing. But you have to be, you have to make sure that nursing has a voice at senior management and that everybody on senior management, no matter what their professional designation, needs to understand what being a BPSO means and how important RNAO best practice guidelines are to what we do here. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, we do have a comment from Judy Ann from uh, UHWI BPSO. And uh, she says that they have a similar problem. We have a pap we have paper-based medical records system and have to do manual audits. Could you share? Oops, let me see here. I think, I, sorry, I just need to be able to get back to the chat. Um, let me see here. Uh, could you share how you structure your audit schedule? I seem to be always running behind in my data collection. Yeah, I, I know exactly what she means. But um, I have to explain, my audits aren't scientific. It's The idea is to just get a snapshot of what practice is like on that particular unit. So what I usually do is the last week of every month, I start, I will pull charts, as I said, between 10 and 20 uh, on the inpatient units, on each inpatient unit. And uh, I've got it down to a science now where I can, uh, that takes me maybe an hour out of my day, and if I have a uh, if I have a nursing student, I give them uh, uh, one of the things that I do is I teach them how to do the audit, and I will also get them collecting that information. But like I say, it's not scientific; it's just a way of um, getting a snapshot of what the staff are doing. Um, one of the things I do on a, a regular basis too is not just take a look at where are the patients being uh, assessed within that 24 hour window, but I take a look at the actual brain assessment and then take a look at the patient history. Do the numbers jive? Does it make sense? Are they giving, uh, are they uh, being realistic when they assess the patient's risk for skin breakdown? And that takes a little bit of time, but uh, so far, in the size of our organization, it's manageable. Uh, at some point, though, I would love to be able to have an electronic report that I could uh, that I could download. Okay, excellent, George. Thanks for sharing your practical tips 
on uh, surveillance. Um, there is another comment um, by the same person. If you'd like to, sh uh, if you could please share the date of the next champion workshop with your friends here at Northwest Lynn. Uh, we don't have a date yet. Um, um, the team at St. Joe's Care Group has uh, submitted all the paperwork. I think we're shooting for early October. And as soon as we actually have a firm date, uh, we'll get the word out because uh, uh, the last couple that, we ha that we've held um, with St. Joe's were well attended. Um, so as soon as we get that information, we'll make sure it's, uh, it's sent out. Great. Thank you, George. Uh, there is a question here, or a couple questions from Paul. How often do you do off the floor education? Do you only offer this education to the nursing champions or to all staff? It's a good question. Well, the lunch and learns we offer to all staff um, um, because it is off the floor. Like I say, we have, it, um, we've been lucky if it's been wound specific education about uh, pre preventing pressure injuries and stuff like that. Every once in a while, we're able to tap into some um, funding from the companies that supply dressings and things like that. So we'll have like, we'll advertise a pizza, pizza lunch ahead of time. And if you feed them, people come. So those are open not only to nursing staff, but they're open to all clinical staff in the hospital, uh, including medical residents and medical students. Um, sometimes we'll, um, gear things or connect education about best practice guidelines to medical rounds. Um, we have shared the podium with um, uh, people from the medical school. Sometimes those uh, medical rounds will happen like at seven o'clock in the morning. Like we're kind of all over the place. Um, we, we just got approved for funding for a best practice champions open house that we'll be holding here in Thunder Bay on Thursday, May the 9th, that's the Thursday during Nurses Week. And we intend to advertise that across the city. So it's not just for our staff. We're hoping we'll get um, uh, a participation from the other uh, organizations like St. Joe's Healthcare and um, uh, Thunder Bay Public Health. Um, that's open to everybody. And it's also uh, open to the schools of nursing. And like I say, uh, the medical school. We have, the university here offers a compressed nursing degree for people who already have a first baccalaureate. And those students are here throughout the school year. They don't take a summer break. So we have students here all the time. Okay, perfect. Uh, Paula, I hope that um, answers your questions. Um, it looks like I don't see, oh, Paul says it did, thank you. <laughs> Judy Ann says thank you as well, George. Okay, so I think that is it for all of the questions, unless there's any last minute ones, or else I think we're going to wrap up here. Okay, so thank you, George, uh, for sharing your knowledge and expertise and your experiences. Um, I mean, it's very helpful for us um, here at home office to have a BPSO designate such as yourself, being able to take the time to share um, share what you know with others in terms of successful BPG implementation and sustainability. Uh, for everyone else, uh, the copy of today's presentation and uh, the webinar recording will be posted at RNEO's website. Uh, so uh, please fill out the evaluation survey as well. We continue to look for topics that resonate with all of you. And if you have any questions, please contact Andrea Stubbs. She's the project lead of the Champions Program at astubbs at rneo.ca. And it looks like we don't have any other questions. Um, everyone says thank you, George. So thank you on behalf of RNEO. Um, it's been a pleasure for everyone to attend and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Have a great weekend, folks. Bye.